Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The opinions of hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinion of this network. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. as they navigate us through the different categories of the unknown and the unexplained, including ghosts and haunted places, cryptids and monsters, aliens and UFOs, theology and mythology, metaphysics, forbidden archaeology, urban legends and folklore, conspiracies, crimes, and corruption with top analysis from the experts of these disciplines. If it's amazing, unusual, or mysterious. If it's bizarre, creepy, and fantastic. If it's unbelievable, paranormal, or supernatural. It's here on Paraversal Universe. Here are your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer. Hello, everyone. Whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are, welcome to Paraversal Universe, brought to you by the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited at the Northwoods Paranormal Resource Center here in Rylander, Wisconsin. We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Malik. Hey, everybody. Paraversal Universe is produced by Kat Hobson, the voice of Fate Magazine Radio over at WBHM, digital broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. We are also heard on WCET 101.7 FM, out of Columbia, South Carolina, High Point Radio, 100.5 FM and 1620 AM out of New Jersey, and the Rift Radio Network family out of Lakeside, Virginia. Welcome one and all, and hello to everybody in the chat room. We look forward to your questions and comments as always. The archive for the show will be available as well. Show archives from over the years can be found in various places on the web including our Archives Like page on Facebook called Paraversal Universe Show Archives. Also check out our guest promo page, Paraversal Universe Radio, for what's upcoming in the near future. We hope everyone is doing well, as always. Spring is finally here in northern Wisconsin. Finally. And that is a good thing. The snow is finally gone. Took a while. Today we are doing the Paralogian Report. But first, as always, uh, let's do our shout-outs. The shout-outs go to those people who shared our show banners this last week. We thank uh, you kindly, and we appreciate it greatly. Who do we have? This week, we have Walt Christos, Thoughts of Christos, Katrina Cooper, Rody Speak, Dennis Koch, Jason Bland, Paranormal Soup, JJ Demlo, J- Jamie Demlos, JJ Paranormal, Metaphysical Bounce, Howie O'Dell from the Orion Effect, Kat Hobson at WBHM, Lawrence DeMiza, Jean Broida, Lisa Reynaga at The Rift, Sudan, Lori Kresslaw, Jennifer Inez, Elaine Dawes, Max Hawthorne, and Trish Freudel. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate that. As I said, uh, this is Paraversal Universe and the Paralogian Report, which we do once a month on average. The Paralogian Report is a paranormal, supernatural, esoteric, Fortean, and geo-exo-political fringe talk radio roundtable with news reports from various alternative outlets all over the world. For this broadcast, we bring you a panel of six individuals 
who each specialize in a different area of the unknown and unexplained to give you a well-rounded analysis of reports uh, we will present here on the show today. So let's, let me introduce today's correspondence to you all. The panel consists of psychologist, ufologist, astrologist, and conspiracy analyst and author Gene Breida, who will be with us for the first half of the show today. Uh, Jean, could you please tell us why that is? I can indeed, Kevin. Astonishingly enough, I won my Toastmasters Division speech evaluation contest, and tonight I'm off to the district competition. Congratulations. Thank yeah. you, thank you. That's awesome. For those, for those who don't know, Toastmasters is an international organization to promote better speaking and communication and leadership. Yes, and everybody involved in those are really good speakers, so well done. Thank you. All righty. We have paranormal investigator and paranormal network owner, Howie Odell. Howie, how are you doing? Good evening, everyone. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Howie owns uh, the Rift Radio Network. And we are glad he is with us today. Yes, we are. Very excited. It's been a while. It has. It has indeed. Too long. Too long. Yes. We have a paranormal investigator and radio network owner, Kat Hobson, host of Fate Magazine Radio and Paranormal Experience. Hi, Kat. Hi there. How are y'all? Doing really well. Doing really well. And we have psychotherapist and paranormal investigator, Tom McGuire. How are you doing today, Tom? I'm doing great. Hello, everybody. And, of course, psychic demonologist Jennifer Malik and myself, paranormal historian, crypto ufologist, and conspiracy analyst Kevin Malik. This is our panel for this broadcast. The concept is simple. One of our panel members will read a news article we have brought to the table then we'll go around the panel and share our perspectives concerning the story or topic. That's all there is to it. Today, Gene will lead us off. What do you have for us, Gene? Thank you, Kevin. Greetings, listeners. I love to tell people that in my job as a writer of conspiracy theories and health and politics and climate, I churn out 3,000 words a day. So right now I'm going to share with you some of those words. Here's an article published in the dailyconspiracy.com on January 14th, 2018, so a little over a year ago, something I penned called Von Braun's Final Warning, Expect UFO False Flag Event. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm a published author of Unknown Objects, the top 10 U.S. UFO cases. Ufology is my bag, baby. I'm also, uh, I have a background in, in psychology and I'm not a nutter. I have a science, a master's of science in computer information systems. So I know a thing or two about a thing or two, but I don't claim to know everything about everything. Anyway, see if you share my enthusiasm for this piece on Werner von Braun. And here we go. The name Werner von Braun conjures up images of V-2 rockets blitzing World War II England for students of history or those old enough to have lived through those tense times. Fewer people know that after the Second War to End All Wars, under covert Operation Paperclip, Americans divvied up captured German scientists with our then ally, Russia, then called the USSR. The United States welcomed a team of scientists with von Braun among them. He continued his research for the U.S. Army, developing ballistic missiles. In 1960, President Eisenhower moved the National Rocket Development Center from Redstone Arsenal to the brand new National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, an organization separate from the U.S. Army. Did you know that NASA reports directly to the White House? As director of NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, 
von Braun led the team which designed and built the historic Saturn V launch vehicle. It was due in large part to German scientists and technology that Alan Shepard became the first American to achieve suborbital flight on May 5th, 1961, and the U.S. Apollo program was able to leave golf balls on the moon. In 1972, von Braun retired from NASA and went to work for Fairchild Industries of Germantown, Maryland, rising to the position of vice president. He died in Alexandria, Virginia on June 16, 1977. Fairchild Industries is composed of many divisions and subsidiaries, but focuses on building aircraft. While working at Fairchild, von Braun met space and missile defense consultant, Dr. Carol Rosen, the first female corporate manager of an aerospace company. A contractor to corporations, government departments, and the intelligence community, she worked on TRW's MX missile. Dr. Rosen is an author and has testified before Congress and the President's Commission on Space. Dr. Rosen also participated in Dr. Stephen Greer's International Disclosure Project at the National Press Club in 2001. She revealed this astonishing conspiracy, quoting Dr. Rosen. When I was a corporate manager of Fair, Fairchild Industries from 1974 through 1977, I met the late Dr. Werner von Braun. We first met in early 1974. At that time, von Braun was dying of cancer, but he assured me that he would live a few more years to tell me about the game that was being played, that game being the effort to weaponize space, to control the Earth from space and space itself. Dr. Rosen went on to explain von Braun's purpose during the last years of his life, his dying years, was to educate the public and decision makers about why space-based weapons are dumb, dangerous, destabilizing, too costly, unnecessary, unworkable, and an undesirable idea, and about the alternatives that are available, unquote. At the time von Braun came to the U.S., our armed forces needed some kind of war to fight to keep their astronomically high, use-it-or-lose-it annual budgets in full swing. Since the hot enemy, Nazi Germany, had been defeated, it was time to find a new target for defense spending. The secret government figured a cold war is better than no war. Using scare tactics to mold public opinion, the intelligence community planned to educate us, the people, into believing that weapons platforms in outer space were and still are necessary for national security. Von Braun told Dr. Rosen on more than one occasion that this re-education program would transpire in three parts, each with its own enemy or threat that required space-based defense. And I'm going to summarize these and get to the number three. Number one, the commies. The Ruskies, the Reds, the Communists, the Cold War, it died. On to the number two, terrorists. I'm going to read a little bit here. Von Braun told Dr. Rosen that terrorists would be identified as the second threat to national security used to justify continuing the Star Wars program. Third world country crazies, now called nations of concern, dominate all mainstream news since the, the infamous 9-11-2001, I call it a false flag terrorist attack. I think it was an inside job. That's me editorializing here on the World Trade Center in New York City. Okay, on to number three from Von Braun. Asteroids. Just like a bad V movie, they will come from outer space. Of course, we must blow them up, asteroids, because, as you know, that's what guys do. It is common knowledge that both the U.S. defense and intelligence agencies are predominantly male, boys and their toys, never mind the consequences. And I rant a little more about that. Here's number four, the last one, aliens or extraterrestrials. Apparently, at the beginning of the article, I could not count to four, and I had said three. So there's an erratum to correct. But number four, aliens or extraterrestrials. Here we go. Dr. Rosen said, Von Braun told her repeatedly, quote, 
And remember, Carol, the last card is the alien card. We are going to have to build space-based weapons against aliens, and all of it is a lie, unquote. Have you noticed that recently mainstream media reporting of UFO and ET phenomena has taken on a new, more serious tone? And I uh, cite an article there, and that's basically it. If you want to do something about this false flag event, uh, they come from outer space, and we need to weaponize space and have a space force and all this stuff that's going on now, you can join Dr. Rosen's Treaty on Prevention of the Placement of Weapons in Outer Space. And if you find this article on the Daily Conspiracy by searching for a keyword, say Von Braun, V-O-N, space, B-R-A-U-N, or UFO, that would also bring up Von Braun's final warning, expect UFO false flag event. What do you guys think? Who would like to go first? I would like to say that I find it interesting. Warner Von Braun was quite the character here in Alabama, obviously. And the Redstone Arsenal and the NASA facilities being here when he was. In fact, the Civic Center is still named for him, which I find interesting too. But I do feel that if he said it, he could probably take it to the bank. He did not have a vested interest once he was glamorized and pulled from the Nazis and treated as a hero here, despite everything he did there. Um, It would not have been in his interest to be spreading disinformation of that nature. And he would have been privy to documents and information relevant to all of these things. So I say you should probably pay attention to that. Howie, any thoughts? Actually, yeah, going back to this and talking about Von Braun and knowing that his background not only was in the public eye, but doing the research on Von Braun and knowing that he was dealing also with flight projects along with, um, say, with the Martin Corporation, etc. He's a very unique individual. And in fact, uh, if you see the movie Fire in the Sky, you'll see at the end how he was approachable, which means not approachable, how he had this specific type of uh, characterization when you walked up to him that even the scientists on board, including um, at the acting time, um, the Air Force or Army Air Corps general himself actually knew his presence and how powerful it was. So it makes you question what the intent was on the whole landscape, both from the public eye as well as in the private eye and how he was overall seen as a character. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, uh, I do believe uh, his, I, if we can call it a prophecy, uh, I've been aware of it for some time, and he's definitely qualified. And, uh, uh, you know, we... We've seen the Cold War. We've seen the terrorists. The asteroid, I think, uh, Sudan and Chat says, if I call, recall correctly, the asteroid thing was a drill. Um, I think the idea, a threat from space, and then the alien threat was the uh, third. So I, maybe that's, uh, Gene, what, why you had said three before. But anyways, yeah, so the threat from space, be it asteroids or aliens, yeah, exactly. If you lump those together as threats from space, right. exactly so. Uh, I think it's accurate. I totally think it's accurate. So do I. And then, you know, Sudan just brought something else up with that. And, you know, he says, also, the solar system is rather isolated in the galaxy, sort of like an interstellar South Sea island. So not so many aliens will be visiting us as a practical matter, except for the equivalent of scientists and military. Hmm. Interesting observation. And certainly there's plenty of technology now that's so far from mainstream and so few people, few people even know it exists. I'm thinking about HARP project. Uh, is it Sunbeam? Something beam. Blue beam. Blue beam that uh, projects holographs into the 
atmosphere, upper atmosphere, by using HARP. That's shooting high-powered microwaves into the upper atmosphere, the ionosphere, to bend out the the shrouding around the Earth, basically molecules, pushes them out. And then, uh, like a Let's- rubber band, snaps back, and you can direct that energy as a weapon. And allegedly, the United States does. So... That's one way. Using holograms, uh, the floating cities over China might be an example of that. Might be. Okay, why don't we... Go ahead. Commercial time. (laughs) It is time for our first commercial break. You're listening to the Paraversal Universe, and we'll be right back with our panel after the first commercials. You're listening to WPHM. Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Come on, I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Son of a... Hey, son. Mother... (laughs) Uh, son, what are you doing? Hey, mom. I'm getting ready to listen to Periscope Uncensored. By expanding your vocabulary. Well, it is uncensored. Son, the uncensored part of Periscope Uncensored is Jax and I getting down to brass tacks with all aspects of the paranormal. There's no fluff on our show. So, no off-color commentary? I didn't say that. Awesome! (laughs) Son? Uh, I just hit my head. Oh boy, I'll go get you an ice pack. Catch Periscope Uncensored Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fate Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown, all of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcast. Listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Welcome back from our first commercial break, everyone. This is Paraversal Universe. Produced by WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCETFM, High Point Radio, and the Rift Radio Network. We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Malik, and we'd like to take a minute and thank everybody who makes Paraversal Universe possible, including graphic art director Lawrence D. Misa, music theme by Matt Stenz, announcer Frank Lee, producer and owner at WBHM Cat Hobson, also to Howie Odell and Lisa Renaga and the Rift family, and to Michael Vera at WCETFM. Thank you all for carrying our content and working together on our behalf and the behalf of the audience everywhere. And, of course, a huge thank you to God in heaven, whose strength beyond strength is stronger than all, for granting us this wonderful show and opportunity here to be with you all. Amen. And appreciation to the various platforms we are on, including iTunes, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, Twitch, YouTube, 
Daily Motion, Talk Stream Live, TuneIn, Blog Talk, Podbean, Google Play, Mixcloud, and Paranormal Livestream app, which is streamed and restreamed from various other outlets all over the world via the Internet. This segment of Paraversal Universe is brought to you by the UFO Wisconsin Research Team, Wisconsin's alternative to MUFON. Okay, back to the show. This is Paraversal Universe and the monthly installment of the Paralogian Report. We are joined by fellow paralogians, psychologist Gene Breida, paranormal investigator Kat Hobson and Howie O'Dell, and psychotherapist Tom McGuire. Uh, and we, uh, when we left, we were talking about uh, the, the up- real danger of a government-driven alien attack false flag event. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Right. And you know we were talking. About- this is what came up, you know, during commercial too, and um, it makes you wonder. With like, as far as media coverage, we saw little to no coverage at all. We saw very little coverage, and uh, I, you know, and uh, like we, we were, were talking about um, when we went to break, we were talking about the meteors. We were talking about the meteors, yes. That were coming close to Earth, and I know we have three coming up this month. Yeah. That are supposed to come really close. I mean, well, very. How close? How many millions of miles is that? Oh, no, we're pretty close. Yeah. yeah. Well, right. still, I mean. Well, they, astronomer, you know, in space, close is millions of miles. I'll, That's I'll a send good you, miss. You know what I'm saying? I'll send you the directory. After. I can't, I don't remember the miles. But I I'll, haven't seen the article. I don't mean to no, belittle no. the information. I watched the, the path trajectories of the the missile, or the missile, the, the asteroid <laughs> and the uh, the planet, and they come pretty close, let's just say. But uh, regardless, be that as it may. Right. Saying, so what I was saying yeah. was, is you know, when you have something like this, you would think that the media would be all over it because they want everybody to know. And I just found it really odd that there was very little. And it just, you know, it was after the fact that it passed by us that they covered it. Well, apparently most people have no interest in science, anything scientific. And if a an extension... <laughs> an extinction level meteor or asteroid were heading for earth and was going to impact there's very little probably we could do about it i mean we've talked for years about shattering these things into another you know into a, a hundred e- extinction events <laughs> you know uh, take one big rock and and shatter it into a hundred or a thousand little rocks that's maybe yeah uh, people don't know you don't know until you've tried something you can theorize till the cows come home. But uh, anybody else want to weigh in on uh, federal government justifying f- taxpayer expense is what we're talking about here to use holograms perhaps and who knows what else, other technologies, high technologies that we know nothing about probably to convince people that they that it's Mars attacks and and to demonize aliens that way by the way uh, as I say in this article here the real danger of a government driven alien attack false flag event is the demonization of all otherworldly or other dimensional beings if you acknowledge the existence of UFOs then they must be peaceful at least superficially we're still here after all that's my take on it um, I had a question for for Gene concerning Werner Van Braun. Um, did he believe that uh, th- there is life in other planets, an intelligent life, or is, um, was that part of it? Or, and he still thinks it's a waste of money to militarize outer space. So you get that part. That's a great question, Tom. And I'm I, looking at I'm looking up the answer right now. <laughs> I would, I would would hazard a guess and say because he was part of the deep state and he was privy <laughs> to secret intel uh, that he would know about anything alien, whether it's extraterrestrial or interdimensional. And that's what I wanted to touch okay. on. Okay, here, here we go. That, oh, go ahead, Kevin. Go um, ahead. Just that uh, we've interviewed other ufologists and whatnot, and we've talked about this, and many of them feel that, uh, at least from what they're they're getting from various sources that uh, that is more of an interdimensional thing than it is a purely extraterrestrial thing. Um, but be that as it may, uh, what were you going to say, Jean? I was going to say I'm looking at an article here about 
Von Braun being interviewed about the Roswell incident, as they're calling it here, and being asked, did the Roswell incident in fact happen? Was an alien craft recovered along with alien bodies? Did you have a chance to go to the crash site? Von Braun lit a cigarette, thought for a second, and then began to discuss the, discuss the crash openly. And he said he was taken to the crash site after the bulk of the mili- military personnel had left the scene. They did a quick once-over of the site. He related how the exterior of the spacecraft was not metal as we know it, but appeared to be made of something biological like skin And then he said, yes, there were alien bodies which were being kept in a medical tent near the UFO. So I would say, yeah, he believed in them. I'm going to bookmark this page here. Back to you. (laughs) Sudan had mentioned in chat, he said, 2.5 distances on Sunday. Uh, Where are we at? Is that? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go up to um, Here it is. 2.5 astronomical units or something, AUs? 2.5 lunar. uh, Lunar distances. Oh, Oh, lunar distances. Yeah. Well, I, well it, that's that is close. That's yeah. close. That's well, I watched this directory and they show the two cross paths. Yeah. And I was surprised well, how close they were. One, I thought it was going to hit. <laughs> all the you, all the guyans in the world need to get together and and emit energy to repulse these things and keep them out in space. Don't let our gravity, don't let our seriousness pull them in. You got to be gay and lighthearted to repel them. Ah, go away. <laughs> <laughs> So Tom is up next. I'll hand the mic to you, Tom. I wanted to shout, give a shout out to my daughters up from Madison, Colleen, and my lovely wife Joanna. Hopefully they they figure out how to listen. Um, okay, th- this article I it's from this uh, the talking about the Society for the Scientific Investigation of Parasciences is looking for proof that psychic abilities exist. Consisting of psychologists, physicists, and biologists, the German-based group maintains that people who claim to possess psychic abilities should be given the opportunity to prove themselves. Each year, candidates are invited to the University of Würzburg to demonstrate their talent under laboratory conditions and there is even a prize of $11,700 in offer to anyone who succeeds. So far, at least 60 people have taken the challenge. However, despite claim, claiming to possess abilities ranging from telekinesis to tel, tel, telepathy, none have managed to prove that psychic powers exist. Um, the quote, we're not here to make people look ridiculous, said researcher Rainer Wolf who oversees the testing. We just want to show that many such claims are nonsense. Last year, one of the candidates who turned up claimed that he was able to move objects around with his mind. The test he was given involved moving a piece of paper contained inside a glass lid. He spent hours attempting to move the paper before eventually admitting defeat. According to Rayner, most of the candidates genuinely believe that they possess specific powers. In many cases, it is a belief that has been built up over the course of many years. In many ways, the group's research is less about validating the existence of such abilities and more about understanding the psychological, the psychology behind why people believe they possess them in the first place. So that that's the article. Um, I I I think it's interesting that um, there's got to be somebody out there that can um, um, show that they do have some type of ability that people just haven't uh, come up for it. Maybe some people are afraid uh, to reveal what what they can do. Um, even though they have a prize of eleven thousand plus dollars, can I go first on this? I'm gonna. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, the psychical uh, uh, research institute. Uh, 
And I think about, uh, like the work of Dr. T. Palmer and Dr. Kennedy, who are, and other doctors. I mean, we, we've interviewed, uh, Lorna Wilson. We had Paula Fenn on. Yes. We've had Tom on. We've had Lisa Saglu on. We've had, uh, many professionals on. Um, some of which are doing scientific research and presenting them to, uh, conferences, uh, you know, academic. Uh, to ac- academic institutions and whatnot. Frederick Myers did a wonderful job. I think uh, um, Ryan's did a wonderful job. I think Zenner did a wonderful job. Uh, universities have spent money in the past studying stuff like this. And then you got to look at, like, uh, you had James Randi going around with his million-dollar uh, challenge. And supposedly three people beat his psychic challenge, and one of which we had on the show, Walter Brooks, an amazing renowned shaman, who clearly beat the challenge. And it's documented, not just by him, but by neutral parties too. So, uh, you know, I and plus we see it all the time. I think that, uh, I think that, you know, um, it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. Half the people out there are skeptical. I think by conditioning. Uh, the other half have more of an open mind towards things. Uh, to me, there is plenty of proof out there, plenty of proof, plenty of research. There, there are thousands of books on the paranormal, some of which have got a lot of good data. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate that it, uh, some of this work is not recognized more, but be that as it may. And then you've got Russell Targ, who worked for DARPA, Defense Area Research Projects Agency, Black Ops. They scientifically demonstrated ESP existence. He's on the lecture circuit now. He's he's lecturing. He's done. Uh, there's a band TEDx talk available on YouTube. He recorded this for TEDx and they wouldn't do it. So that's how hush hush it is. Uh, there's plenty of proof. But people with ESP don't necessarily want to become sideshow freaks targets for negative notoriety and I have to say there's a reason Tom why the promoter put in a disclaimer we don't mean to show anybody up here or whatever it was exactly that you said yeah they do yes they do (laughs) their intention is to to deny and discredit in my opinion but if somebody went up there and juggled balls in the air with with their minds that would be worth some money wouldn't it I meant to say Society of Psychical Research. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kat. I was just going to say that this is this is not something that's hidden at all. I mean, Lloyd Auerbach, what was it, five years ago, wrote a book, Psy Wars, and he co- collaborated with his Russian counterpart. The fact that the government is so convinced that psychics are the real deal that they were going to use them as weapons and defensive weapons as offensive and defensive is not unheard of. It's not a secret. It's a great big out in the middle of the world thing. It's a real thing. And I mean, I don't know why anybody would be embarrassed or ashamed to participate in something. I mean, there are a lot of people sitting on this panel who are gifted and can do things. I was going to say, I married a uh, psychic. Exactly. She does what doing. And they, in fact, uh, Dr. Chuck Kennedy at the PSI uh, Institute. Institute of Chicago um, has data and statistics on missing person and cold cases solved by psychics. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, and, so, and they, they had success. And the, the CIA success. and the deep state would not have remote viewers, uh, you know, um, psychic spies, those kinds of things. In fact, uh, right, I mean, they're very effective weapons, defensive and offensive. They actually spotted a submarine. I believe it was a submarine being built inland. In Russia, during um, oh, which war was that? 
is irrelevant. But they actually did see this through remote viewing. And it was very effective. It was a necessity to be able to accomplish these things. Yeah, we actually have a book on the on the topic of remote viewers here, and it is actually called, and it's a really good book, and I've read it before, but it's been such a long time, so I'm, going to re- I'm in the process of rereading it again. It's called Remote Viewers, mm-hmm. The Secret History of America's Psychic Spies by Jim Schnabel, and it's Ooh. a really good book. You know, let me read a couple of the quotes on the back. Yeah. One is from Major General Edmund D. Thompson. I never like to get into debates with the skeptics. Because if you didn't believe that remote viewing was real, you hadn't done your homework. Okay. How about former President Jimmy Carter? She went into a trance, and while she sat there in a trance, she gave us some latitude and longitude figures. We focused our satellite cameras on that point, and the lost plane was there. Um, I could go on and on. Well, this did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So I think the article. I, I find to be actually, um, yeah, and this uh, was actually, and this was actually happened around the Cold War. Right. You know, it's it's again like we see at the end of every show. To the believer, the evidence is overwhelming. Right. And skeptic, there'll never be enough. Right. And I, I think so. You know, that's what you get. You know, in this case, you know. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping somebody steps up to the plate and, and with all the laboratory conditions and that, uh, it will be revealed that there are people out there that have gifts and they only tested 60 people, uh, so far. You mean in that, that, uh, study? You know, um, for sure, I, what were you going to say? I was going to ask if Howie had any thoughts on this. Oh, I got a message from Howie. He had to step away for ah, a little bit, okay. which is why okay. I um, haven't okay. passed it to him. <laughs> okay. But uh, um, Well, I've got someone in the Spreaker chat who is, um, well, the host of Fascination Street, Jimmy and Mika Pearson. And there's actually a film coming out relevant to this subject called uh, third Eye Spy, and I'll share that link with y'all. But um, Simon Hine is doing some great art remote viewer projects on Twitter. And so it's it's really going to be something I mean, it's out in, it's out in public. I mean, social media public. And yeah, you know, there's he has a guest coming on who trained with Russell Targ. So it's just interesting. I love this topic. But I don't think that I don't think that there's anything covert or hidden about any of this anymore. Well that's because you live in the world of the paranormal cat. I'll tell well, you what I also you go, read mainstream go. media and it's there too. More and more and more. And as I said, uh, as I say in many of my articles, the whole topic of UFOs, ETs, and and, uh, paranormal things generally are being taken more seriously. I think it used to be the human interest segment of the news. Still is to some extent. But when police officers are are filing reports and you have photographs of them next to civilians with fingers pointing into the air, and I'm thinking specifically of an event from Colorado that happened a few years ago. And it was Breckenridge, which is a ski town, but this was in the summertime. Um, I don't want to. Three, I, I three hate, orbs I, in the air, daylight. Go ahead. I hate to interrupt everybody, <laughs> but it's time for our next commercial break. You are listening to Paraversal Universe. We will be right back with our panel for the next segment. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio, broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama.
Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Welcome back from our second break. This is Paraversal Universe on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Also heard on WCETFM, High Point Radio, and the Rift Radio Network. We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Malik. Before we get back to the show, we want to tell you all that we are on Twitter as the NWPS and MeWe as Paraversal Universe. Our like and group pages on Facebook are under various headings as well. Having said that, check out our Society's Like page on Facebook, the Northern Wisconsin Paranormal Society Limited, as well as Jennifer's Like page, Jennifer Malik, Psychic Demonologist. Leave a like if you like what you see. We always appreciate it. And there are some Facebook group pages on uh, Facebook we want to check out. The Ultimate Conspiracies group page is one. The Lake Monstrosities group page is another. Feel free to join them both. We'd love to see you there. Uh, each network mention has a group and like page on Facebook as well. So check that out for upcoming content. Uh, this segment is brought to you by the book Trail of the Sasquatch, A Shaman's Journey, by cryptozoologist and Iroquois shaman Don Young, who is also a member of the NWPS. Check out his Facebook group pages, Kindred Forest and Indigenous Americas. And also check out Gene Breida's book, Unknown Objects, Top 10 U.S. UFO Cases. Any comments for this week's show can be addressed in the live chat room. Let's get back to the show. This is Paraversal Universe and the Paralogian Report. Fringe news and analysis. And Kat is going to start off this round. Thank you. I am, I was so torn. I had two, one of which was a very simplistic but important uh, paranormal article. The other one is from NASA on their next step, the human landing system. And there's an updated synopsis beyond this one, but basically it reads, NASA has updated the Next Step H pre-solicitation notice under the second Next Space Technologies for Explanation Partnerships, which is Next Step, broad agency announcement. The original pre-solicitation notice described intent to solicit proposals for activities related only to the ascent element of the human landing system. This update signals intent by the end of May 2019 to seek proposals from industry in support of rapid development of an integrated human lunar landing system, including elements such as descent element, ascent element, and transfer vehicle. NASA will seek proposals from U.S. industry for the development, integration, and crewed demonstration of these elements as a functional human landing system that can fill NASA and industry requirements and meet the challenge to send the next man and the first woman to the moon by 2024. Activities under the next step, human landing system studies, risk reduction, development, and demonstration will be integrated with proposed activities under next step H. And, excuse me, there was an updated synopsis, good heavens, Synopsis update, April 8th, and it follows in response to Vice President Mike Pence's recent announcement directing NASA to return humans to the surface of the moon by 2024. NASA has assessed options for meeting this challenge by accelerating the development of the human landing system. And then it goes on to talk about, you know, the same thing that it said. And the primary objective is to enable the rapid development of individual lander elements, achieve the integration of these elements into a safe and functional human landing system that can meet NASA and industry requirements, and execute the crude demonstration of that human landing system to Moon. And you know, I am going to leave this here because it includes the submission information, and if anyone wants that, you're welcome to ask me. But um, I will get it to you. But I just find it interesting that all of a sudden, this is such a priority. 
I am fascinated because I know that this is going to be integrated into the human landing systems for Mars. So, what do y'all think? Is this just stepping things up? Or are we trying to get off the planet? Is there something we don't know? Maybe back to the asteroids? <laughs> well, you know, uh, Trump did announce his Space Force this year. Yeah, he did. <laughs> but ostensibly, so. that's already in place with the 20 plus, uh, 20 plus 10. So, you know, Corey well, did tell me he has been in it. So. Yeah, you know. Um, so did, uh, William White Crow. Yes. We interviewed him before he passed. He had quite a few things to say about it. And, uh, you know, he was a very well-respected person. Yes. A well-respected chairman. So, uh, we had no reason to doubt him. I mean, so, yeah, you know, um, definitely, most definitely. I think that, uh, well, you know, like with the Navy now, talking about, you know, UFOs mm -hmm. and how we're going to look at them and, and uh, present them. And, well, we had UFOs uh, come up in mainstream media a couple times within the last year. Ufology has now become a uh, science. It's no longer a pseudoscience, but is actually an uh, academic accredited science now according to academia yes all within the last year so are they stepping it up i would say yes why and it goes back to the prophecy we were talking about right yeah is gene still with us yes indeed i was just listening avidly and keenly and hoping tom might pitch in there a bit too um i i thought one thought I had is uh, if uh, private industry is involved with going to the moon, it'd be because they want to make money somehow. So it's probably going to be mining and other things to get minerals and um, and then uh, it's a good place to uh, test out things uh, to um, end up, you know, reaching out with new equipment that will be useful in outer space and maybe even going to Mars. So it makes sense that we're going back to the moon. Well, did anyone see, and this was brought up to me in the speaker chat because I had forgotten that, but there is an article that was actually one of my alternates that was relevant to Buzz Aldrin. It was like a two paragraph article, but Buzz Aldrin was actually just adamant that we have got to find a way to get off planet, to get to Mars, to survive. And the article that was, following that in my feed was one that says, why are we going to a dead planet? Yeah. You know, why would we go that way? And I'm like, well, because that's the one that environmentally we stand a better chance of survival on. I don't right. know. A bunch you know. of choices. Right. Well, humans have been looking at terraforming and creating oases in desert environments, whether it's sand or water. Uh, the, uh, Asia is coming out with some astonishing new technologies that we're not hearing about in the United States unless you read scientific journals, and very apparently not that many people do. But be that as it may, there are deep, deep, deep sea bases being constructed now. The first one's being constructed by the Chinese. It's so deep, only their equipment, their submarines, will be capable of docking at these depths. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have a technological edge, both uh, to address something that Tom was saying. Yeah, we humans, yes, are going back to the moon. China and Japan have launched to the far side, both saying they intend to colonize the moon. So what happened to the aliens who told Armstrong 
that humans aren't welcome there. Has that deal been renegotiated? And again, I'm speaking to ufologists, people who understand the history of ufology. If you're a newcomer to the topic, this sounds like crazy talk. But in context, there are ramifications to what's going on now. And and we're try- ufologists are trying to pierce the veil of understanding through a smokescreen that the media is putting up about directing attention in different directions away from clear and present realities. So what if Mars is or isn't uninhabitable? The military attitude is we conquer unhospitable and uninhabitable, uninhabitable, uninhabitable environments. We make them habitable. We make them hospitable. And I've seen recently, I've seen diagrams for biodomes for deployment on Mars. Mm-hmm. Why this focus on going to the moon, to the Mar- to, to Mars? Is it escapism from the Earth? Have we trashed Earth or are we going to be trashing Earth or do they know an extinct, they, powers that be, Illuminati, Cabal, New World Order, know that some extinction, extinction level event is coming and we already have one. We might as well Fikushima. bail. You know, let's bail. Fukushima is an extinction event yep. if they don't get a handle on it. We already have our extinction event, and no one knows how to fix it. They've tried everything that has been researched. They've tried unbelievable things that nobody ever even contemplated being a possibility. The most magnificent robot known to humankind was sent in that was designed to stand those temperatures and save us, and he melted down before he got anything accomplished. Yeah, robots so are it's, not that. he's. <laughs> robots are it's, not he's. And well, now the Japanese have a new robot that can withstand more of that intense heat and pressure. They are plodding along. I just wrote a two-part article for the Daily Conspiracy about Fukushima update. And mm-hmm. I also wrote a health article, I know we're getting to the top of the hour here, about clay. Check out bentonite clay. It comes from Fort Benton in Wyoming. It's the largest deposit of bentonite clay it absorbs toxins including radiation check it out bentonite clay well i know that people have eaten that so exactly you eat it or you apply it to your skin Mm -hmm. and check there's many many articles about this and i just wrote one on that too and with that it is time for our next commercial break you are listening to the paraversal to paraversal universe. This is the Paralogian report. We will be right back with our panel after this after these commercials. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Live from NPR News in Washington, I'm Lakshmi Singh. In a standoff over the balance of power between the government's legislative and executive branches, House Judiciary Committee Chairman Jerry Nadler is dialing up the pressure on Attorney General William Barr to release unredacted portions of Special Counsel Robert Mueller's report or face contempt of Congress. NPR's Kelsey Snell reports Nadler is giving Barr until Monday morning to respond. House Democrats are giving Barr through the weekend to comply with a subpoena to turn over the entire Mueller report on Russian election interference. Nadler informed Barr of the new deadline in his letter to the Justice Department. In the letter, Nadler says the committee is prepared to make, quote, every realistic effort to reach an accommodation with the department. But Nadler says he will move to contempt proceedings if the department continues what he called baseless refusals to comply with the subpoena. Democrats are escalating their demands for documents related to the Mueller report and other ongoing investigations into the Trump administration. Kelsey Snell, NPR News, Washington. In the midst of a proxy fight over Venezuela, President Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin Talk by phone for about an hour today. NPR's Tamara Keith reports that in addition to discussing the growing political crisis in South America, 
The special counsel's Russia investigation also came up during the conversation. Top U.S. officials have complained that Russia is propping up Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, even as the U.S. and many other countries now recognize opposition leader Juan Guaido as the legitimate president of Venezuela. But when President Trump recounted his conversation with Putin about Venezuela, he seemed to accept or at least repeat Putin's description of Russian involvement. And he is... uh not looking at all to get involved in Venezuela other than he'd like to see something positive happen for Venezuela. This would seem to contradict U.S. National Security Advisor John Bolton, who recently said Russia has moved military personnel and equipment into Venezuela, which would mean Russia is very much already involved. Tamara Keith, NPR News. The United States is coming off a stronger-than-expected month in hiring. NPR's Shannon Van Sant reports on the government's April assessment of this country's labor market. Payrolls climbed by 263,000 in April, and the jobless rate fell to 3.6 percent. Average hourly earnings growth was unchanged at 3.2 percent. President Trump has been calling for a Federal Reserve interest rate cut to support the economic expansion, which is poised to become the nation's longest on record at mid-year. The payroll gains were uneven. Construction, health care, professional and business services posted gains, while retail employment fell by 12,000. That's NPR Shannon Van Sant reporting. Before the close, the Dow is up nearly 200 points or three quarters of a percent at 26,504. This is NPR News. The city of Minneapolis will pay $20 million to settle a lawsuit filed by the family of an unarmed woman who was fatally shot by an officer after she alerted police about a possible crime in progress. Earlier this week, a jury convicted Mohammed Noor of murder and manslaughter in the 2017 death of Justine Ruschek. She had called 911 to report what she thought might be a sexual assault near her home when she approached the squad car in the dark alley. Noor shot her. The defense argued that Noor perceived a threat and thought he was acting to protect himself and his partner. With three weeks to go, the European Parliament elections are shaping up to be one of the most important. NPR Silvia Poggioli reports the leader of Italy's Populist League Party is working to unite the union's right-wing parties under an anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim and Eurosceptic banner. Italy's interior minister Matteo Salvini wants to make the Eurosceptic group the European Parliament's biggest. It already includes France's hard-right national rally and the German alternative for Germany. Salvini's latest target is the EU's black sheep, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. The EU Parliament's centrist European People's Group has suspended Orban over his mounting authoritarianism. Salvini and Orban bonded Thursday as they visited the razor wire fence Orban built in 2015 to keep out asylum seekers. As the two populists met, EU MPs and academics meeting in Florence warned that a populist surge would promote national sovereignty over a transnational European Union. Silvia Poggioli, NPR News, Florence. I'm Lakshmi Singh, NPR News in Washington. Welcome back to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is five minutes after the hour. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. This is Paraversal Universe, produced by WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. Also heard on the Rift Radio Network out of Virginia, WCETFM out of South Carolina, and High Point Radio out of New Jersey. We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Malik, coming to you from the Northern Wisconsin uh, here at the Northridge Paranormal Resource Center in Rylander. Uh, and this is the Paralogian Report with correspondence, uh, psychologist Jean Breuer, uh, who just left for her Toastmaster competition. We wish her luck. Psychotherapist Tom McGuire, who is in the house with us. And paranormal investigator Kat Hobson. You can always enjoy excellent Fringe Talk Radio for awesome and informative radio shows about the paranormal, supernatural, esoteric, and for TN topics on this network and affiliate platform websites. Not only our show, but many other good shows about different facets of the unknown and unexplained. Much to listen to and much to enjoy. I should also say that Howie is also left for the episode. We thank him for joining us for the first part. Um, stream live on TuneIn iTunes and the Paranormal Livestream app, available from Android app and iTunes store. This segment is brought to you by the Supernatural Magazine, 
where our articles can be read. All right, back to Paraversal Universe and the Paralogian Report, which covers news, history, and analysis about topics from the fringe recesses of the world, be it paranormal, supernatural, Fortean, esoteric, or geo- and exopolitical, with uh, one of the most diverse and experienced panel presentations found on Fringe Radio. Let's get back to it. So, we since we are on the topic of space and mysteries involving such and space exploration yes uh cat's going to read another article that she has brought to the table uh what do you have cat well this is from unexplainedmysteries.com and when i read it i thought well this is interesting and the t- the title is the veteran apollo astronaut has called on the U.S. government to hasten its efforts to colonize Mars. And this is relevant to Buzz Aldrin calls for mass migration to Mars. And it is dated today. And writing in the Washington Post, Aldrin, who famously walked on the moon with fellow astronaut Neil Armstrong, as part of the groundbreaking Apollo 11 mission in 1969, called on both Congress and President Trump to not only send humans to Mars, but also to build up a permanent presence there. Human nature, and potentially the ultimate survival of our species, demands humanity's continued outward reach into the universe, he wrote. The emphasis, he argues, should not be on a few hijinks or joy rides, but to work together with other countries to achieve a permanent settlement on Mars. This can then facilitate what Aldrin refers to as the great migration of humankind to Mars. In a world of division and distraction, the mission is unifying for all Americans and for all humankind, he wrote. With NASA currently targeting 2033 as the earliest possible date for a manned mission to Mars, perhaps Aldrin's vision of a united interplanetary human race is not as far-fetched as it seems. And... I just really thought it was interesting that a person who was ostensibly the guy who would have been told, don't even show back up here when they were on the moon, is the guy who's pushing us to Mars. Yeah, because I felt like the ultimate goal back in the 60s had been settling on the moon yeah having living settlements i mean there were even i was eight years old when they walked on the moon and i remember the diagrams and the plans and everybody would be doing you know spacesuit things and you go through an air chamber or airlock into your habitation rather like the jetsons but more like army barracks than the, the skyscrapers so I just found that interesting. You know, if there were to be a future uh, false flag alien invasion, would they claim it's coming from out of our solar system? Or would they claim it's coming from within our solar system? You know, what if, well, I mean, even sending someone to Mars, I mean, that's not something that, uh, they have openly done yet. I think, of course, my belief is that we've already been to Mars. Uh, my belief is that, uh, you know, as far as going to the moon, I, I think there is a presence on the moon and in the moon uh, that is, uh, I don't know if they're in unison with well, the deep state, but uh, certainly like Buzz, Ald- Buzz Aldrin, uh, also famous for punching many reporters, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, I am sure they needed it, but you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not justifying violence. Well, they come up to him and they, you know, harass him and stuff. And, sure. And I think they're asking legitimate questions, to be honest. I mean, uh, but, you know, um, he, he is a spokesman. He will always be a spokesman for NASA. Yes, he will. And, and he is, uh, well, he's a master. He's Illuminati. 
so he's definitely in the club for sure no doubt so um whatever agendas they want to put put out there um i feel that he will back them i mm-hmm. why he wants to push for mars and why this push for mars all of a sudden again that's a that's a good question um very interesting it is i would love to know what the ultimate goal is why this is being manipulated with such finesse yeah so do i and i think it'll be interesting as we follow this you know and see what what comes of it yes. because you know immediately when i when i hear about something like that and you know it's kind of like a double-edged sword on one thing you know again on one side it's space exploration and people want to get out there and explore other planet under plant other planets and stuff like that and I, t- and I totally understand that but i don't understand all of a sudden why the big push is there something going on that we're not aware of right especially after not going to the moon for how long openly again and i i mean there's there is ufo activity around the moon uh, there are so many videos. If you type in UFOs around the moon, um, it's, you just keep going on and on. And there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, what we would call, uh, amateur, uh, astronom- uh, astronomists, uh, you know, going outside, uh, filming, uh, with their telescope, sh- shots at the moon, and you see these things flying around the moon, and it's, uh, all the quite time. A- all the time. So there's ex- there's stuff going on up there. I don't know what the politics involved is if if we're welcome, if we're not welcome. Uh, you know, um, I think that the politics, as far as like China going to the moon and, and America, you know, where we want to go and who's going where. Um, I think that's just it, it. I think it's much different than what's going on deep within. You know what I'm saying? Like we're told one thing and there's something else going on. So. Well, sure, but you know something that something else that you can look at is um, Mike Barra is someone who is kind of a ufologist. He's more of a let's look at things closely kind of a person, and he lectures and he appears on television and things. And I saw one of his lectures and. He had actual um, imagery from the moon, like taken by NASA. Well, when he put a filter over it, you could actually see structures on the horizon. And they weren't just little structures. They were interesting structures. They were structures like if you were looking at a downtown area, structures. Mm -hmm. And... I thought, hmm, I wonder what's on that filter. (laughs) (laughs) Let me see your filter. But, you know, it's something that he has done multiple times. He doesn't get, he doesn't get called out because people know, you know, that, there's a strong possibility this is real, and they've, I'm sure they've been checked out his work, too. It's just a thing. Just an idea. Hmm. No? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, my introduction to uh, anomalies on the moon, anomalies on Mars, R- Richard Hoagland, of course, Um as a teenager, uh, there was a uh, there were there was a guy who owned a movie one of the uh, VHS movie stores in town, and uh, he had a shelf um, behind the counter with it was just a little shelf, and it had the conspiracies, you know, Bigfoot, Loch Ness monster, and one of them was a video Richard Hoagland had first put out. Um, he was still with Ohio State, I believe, he was as a professor. And he was, of course, and it was on the moon and structures on the moon. Um, some of them very tall, possibly glass-like structures. Uh, um, real stuff, you know. Exactly, uh, yeah. 
So there's no doubt in my mind that that there's uh, so much more going on out there, so much more. I mean, if we knew the truth, it would probably just blow our minds. I mean, it's, it's you know, but it is what it is. So, Okay, so Jennifer is up next. What time is it? Um, oh, two minutes before break, is it? Um, we okay. have three and a half. Well, we can read the article and then discuss it when we come back, if you want. But it's, or we can continue talking about what we're talking until after the commercial break because. Okay. So, um, yeah, and another question I have, you know, with the whole Mars thing and is, uh, and it's kind of like the same thing with the space station. And with the space station, we have footage that is clearly CGI and faked. Some of it is shot underwater. You can see bubbles. Some of it's CGI clearly. Um, and, you know, and we're told that's from the space station, right? We're also told that there's a ton of junk out there flying around at unheard of speeds. And that even something as small as a dime can come flying through, hit the space station, and do major damage. And yet there's no damage ever. Um, I just, so when I hear stuff like that, it makes me scratch my head. And then you got the, the, the moon landing, right? When there's video clearly of uh, NASA in Greenland, in the middle of Greenland, and a very remote, rocky surface that looks just like Mars, with NASA vehicles, tents, movie cameras, and guess what? A rover, okay? Um, some people actually were out there, um, and they came across NASA way deep in Greenland filming. And you got to wonder, uh, you know, what's – what. I, when I when I see stuff like that, it's just to me it's like you know, is the even the rover stuff we're getting legitimate? Would they give us that? Would they even give us that? You know, have we even got something over there? For all we know, we're not even allowed to go on Mars at all. So, yeah, right. But then on the other hand, we're supposed to have a space force that goes to Mars, and you know, there's supposed to be um, an alien race under Mars. Well, they go, they go, you know, according to the Space Force, the people that say they've been part of it, they go a lot more than Mars, right? They, they go intergalactic. Right. Yep. They have all kinds of stuff. Then you get a whole different kind of physics involved. Yes. A bunch of them. (laughs) And with that, it is time for our next commercial break. You are listening to Paraversal Universe. With This is the Paralogian Report. We will be right back with our panel for the next segment. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio. Come on, I'm Southern, but... Um, nope. That'll do. Hello, I am Kat Hobson, host of Paranormal Experience here on WBHN Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. I enjoy having guests from all areas of the paranormal, from ghosts to ufology to cryptids and beyond. You'll find some of the best researchers in their fields bringing you some great information. Join me on Wednesday nights from 8 to 10 p. Eastern here on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Son of a... Hey, son. Mother... (laughs) Uh, son, what are you doing? Hey, mom. I'm getting ready to listen to Periscope Uncensored. By expanding your vocabulary. 
Well, it is uncensored. Son, the uncensored part of Periscope Uncensored is Jax and I getting down to brass tacks with all aspects of the paranormal. There's no fluff on our show. So, no off-color commentary? I didn't say that. Awesome! (laughs) Son? Uh, I just hit my head. Oh boy, I'll go get you an ice pack. Catch Periscope Uncensored Thursday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, only on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. Since 1948, Fake Magazine has brought you reports of the strange and unknown. All of them true. Fate Radio is carrying on that tradition, bringing you the unusual, macabre, strange, and bizarre. Join host Cat Hops Sunday nights from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern on WBHM Digital Broadcasting. You are listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting, Birmingham, Alabama. Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 23 minutes after the hour. Hello, everyone. Welcome back from our commercial break. This is Paraversal Universe, produced by WBHM Digital Broadcasting, also heard on WCETFM and affiliates, and on the Rift Radio Network. We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Mal. And this is the Paralogian Report. We are joined by fellow correspondents, uh, paranormal investigator Kat Hobson, and psychotherapist Tom McGuire. Uh, before we get back to the interview, let's take a quick moment to specifically mention the radio call dials for the AM, FM, terrestrial radio stations who carry Paraversal Universe, including WCET, which is located on 101.7 FM out of Columbia, South Carolina, and on High Point Radio, which can be found on 100.5 FM and 1620 AM out of New Jersey which broadcast in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. So hello to all of you who are tuning in over the airwaves. Thank you so much. We are glad you are with us. This segment is brought to you by the Parasociology Like page on Facebook. Parasociology is a study of how paranormal manifestations and experiences can affect a family, group, or a collective. Parasociology also examines how spirituality is practiced in different cultures. So go check that out. And leave a like for future content. All right. Back to the show. This is Paraverse Universe. And enter the Paralogian Report. So it is my turn to read an article. Oh, I'm sorry. We're going... uh, Duh. Um, (laughs) I'm getting way ahead of myself. It's Jennifer's turn. Um, My bad. I'm sorry, dear. It's okay. Uh, So, (laughs) So the article I have comes from the Broad Street Beacon. And when I came across this, I thought that this was perfect for the show. Family cited for Viking funeral on local lake. The the senior bar starred, who was 92 years old when he passed last week, requested that that he receive a full Viking burial on the water. So Cascade Shores, California, a local family from the Cascade Shores housing development is in hot water for attempting to cremate a deceased relative on Scott's Flat Lake earlier today. The Barstard or Barstad family recently suffered the loss of the family's patriarch, Norman, who had lived with the family at their Spanish Lane home. He was 92 years old when he passed last week. Uh, Requested that he receive a full Viking funeral on the water. That family agreed to his last wish. Unfortunately, neither the Nevada County Health Department or the sheriff, who answered numerous 911 phone calls, 
seemed to think that this was a good idea. Generally, the burning of bodies on an open and public water space is frowned upon, said Nevada County Sheriff Keith Royal in a prepared press statement. And although there are no specific laws preventing a traditional Viking funeral on Scott's flat, you can't just set stuff on fire and send it off into the lake, especially things as ex- as explosive as this. According to witnesses at the lake, the family gathered on the shore of the Nevada Irrigation Ditch owned lake around 11 a.m. Friday. A large Dodge truck was towing what appeared to be a homemade pontoon boat. There is in some there is some debate about the makeup of the boat. Some said it looked like a pile of logs. Others had said it looked like a repurposed pontoon boat covering and kindling. What was not in question was what happened once it arrived in the middle of the lake and detonated. Hit by flying debris. Yeah, I was fishing, said handyman Hank Snow in a Beacon telephone interview. I saw these guys lower this homemade pile of sticks down the boat launch ramp. I didn't think much of it because, well, you know, this is Nevada County, and I figured it was a a back-to-nature type of thing. But when no one got on the boat, and then about 200 yards out, it exploded into flames, I was like, holy smokes, and dialed 911. There was debris flying everywhere. I think I got hit with a detached finger. Jimmy, the son of the incinerated father who organized and built the cremation boat, said he may have overstocked the vessel with too much gasoline and surplus Illegal fireworks from the last 4th of July. Well, I wanted to make sure that it went off and worked, said a somewhat proud and nervous Jimmy. So I really stuffed that thing with everything flammable that I could think of and find. (laughs) I just didn't think gasoline would explode like that, although it would work more like lighter fluid on my Weber grill. So the explosion scared the heck out of everyone. We're still picking up pieces of dad all over the Cascade (laughs) shore. The big kaboom. Instead of engulfing the senior family member in gentle, majestic Viking flames, the homemade barge violently exploded sending bits of senior flying over the Cascade shores, while some of the remains of Mr. Burstard immediately disintegrated from the intense explosion, some body parts landed around the development. I heard this explosion in the distance, said Cascade Shores resident Sherry Smith. I didn't think much of it at first because... We were always hearing crap like that up here, you know, shotguns and whatnot. It wasn't until I heard a thump on my metal roof. I went outside, and right as I looked up, part of a leg slid down and Mm. whacked me in the head. It was pretty horrible. Other neighbors then reported mostly wood debris in, on, and around their properties, One local family was struck by flying fragments while using their powerboat on the lake. We went, we were out there with the family, said Grant of Nevada City. We had borrowed my dad's boat and were tooting around the lake. We didn't see the explosion. We heard it. We were up by the dam, which is kind of far away. We still got showered with a bunch of sticks and things. I hope that they were just things. As for the family, they have no regrets about giving their patriarch a proper Viking burial. It's the Viking way, said Jimmy, describing the last wish of his now incinerated father. 
We were happy to pay the fine to give dad the burial he wanted. We knew there would be some risk, but this is Nevada County, and we hoped that no one would notice or catch that much. <laughs> Turns out we were, we were correct, except for the sheriff and county officials. I hope to have my burial on Lake Tahoe someday, but that will be a tricky, a trickier one for my kids to figure out. I'm glad they got to see their grandpa leave us like this. It was a special day for everyone. So, of course, my question is, everybody, what is everybody's thoughts on this? Because when I read this, I was just like, wow. My I, first I, thought is, oh, my goodness. <laughs> what did they think would happen? I think a it's, traditional Viking funeral doesn't have any explosives on board. I would agree. Yeah, and fireworks? I mean, the minute I heard fireworks, it's like... You knew okay, it was in trouble. Problem. Right. I mean, and you figured if Dad were in control of this, like, you know, like, okay, you know, son, I want a Viking burial, and you figured maybe Dad and his years of wisdom would also tell his son how to go about it. Maybe they would research it and find out you know, instead of just saying, I found everything flammable and explosive I could think of, and I packed it all on there. I mean, of course, it's going to blow up. I mean, it seems to me that was the problem. The issue was that body parts and wood went flying and, everywhere. Right, and what about those poor people that got smacked in the head in various parts of their, their bodies right. with body parts? Or the leg falling off the roof. Or, yes, the leg. I Can mean, you imagine being that poor woman? That's a very graphic and going out there, as the noise was, and getting whacked in the head by somebody's leg. Yeah. Um. Good heavens. Yeah. They should have been in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they should have been in trouble. That's just um, unacceptable to not research something of that nature. No, I think what what got me when my 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 oh my gosh moment was when I read that that, that his family had saved fireworks from a previous 4th of July. Yeah, fireworks, I mean, that, that I don't know. That's just, uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure the Vikings didn't pack fireworks on their, you know, so, but yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> had the Chinese invented them then? I mean, and had they interacted? There's all kinds of questions relevant <laughs> to that, but it's just mainly... Jiminy crickets. And, you know, I bet this isn't the first time this has happened. No. I mean, if you think about the fact that we have 8 billion people on the planet <laughs> um, for all of human history, I'm sure, you know, like you said, like, especially like in China when they're inventing gunpowder and fireworks and, you know, <laughs> testing <It's>... it. And... <laughs> hey, it gives one to... pause. Yeah. <laughs> They wanted to give him a memorable, a memorable send off, and they did. Mission accomplished. <laughs> and it was memorable for the local residents that were hanging out around their houses and being recreationalists on the lake that day. And just walking out the front door. Alrighty. That's truly astounding. It is. And, and yeah, I want to. I want to thank Sudan for posting the link. In our chat. So, that was something. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what, though. That gives whole new meaning to, you know, cheaper funeral costs. We talk about this all the time where people pay so much money for burial and, crem and cremation. And yet you look at something like this and this was just. Well, I'm going to say those fireworks, the boat mm -hmm. that they made to put it on, paying for those other people's boats, paying for the damage for property, paying for the emotional uh, Distress. Trauma. trauma and the physical trauma I mean if you get pegged by a finger that you didn't know was coming it's got to be bad <laughs> I'm sorry I don't mean to laugh but it just is that is just so Twilight Zone Blues Brothers <laughs> kind of a let's rock this town go out with a literal bang mm -hmm. it was a memorable that was right. a memorable farewell. Yeah. 
but for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> hey, but at least on their end, it was cost effective than having to pay upwards of how much money for burial or cremation. Well, that saved the money for the fines and, you know, <laughs> right, <exactly>. everything else. <laughs> the therapy. I wonder what they got. You know, that's, that's, uh, well, I, I, I don't think anyone was traumatized by it. So that's good. Right. I mean, Oh, you know they were. The leg falling on her head? Suppose. I mean, if she started having nightmares about stuff. Kind of weird. But, yeah, I I suppose, you know. Um, and other people might just shrug it off and laugh it off. But uh, that's how he wanted to go out. Maybe he didn't expect to go out with such a bang. He was probably, you know, I'm sure he was probably laughing his, his butt off. <laughs> watching his son and probably shaking his head like, oh, I don't believe that just happened. I can't believe I raised that man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, we should have planned this better. All right, so Kevin, it's your turn. It is. We have, well, I got four minutes. I'll see if I can read this one. I had brought two articles um, to the table, both on uh, paracryptozoology. Um, so the first one, the first article is written uh, by yours truly and uh, published in Supernatural Magazine. Uh, it's called an overview on paracryptozoology. And uh, the reason I'm bringing this uh, to the roundtable is because the next article that I have that's also related with this is a new article about Nick Redfern and his views on cryptozoology versus paracryptozoology. So, paracryptozoology, the study of undiscovered animal species with the premise or notion that some of these scientifically unidentified cryptids may have powers or abilities that humans don't possess. Although the idea of cryptids with abilities we would define as supernatural or paranormal isn't really a new one, the emergence of this newer field is. And that has been finally accepted by many in both the cryptozoological field as well as prospective paranormal fields. This is due in large to four main factors. One is the amount of bizarre reports over the years which have either uh, been collected by cryptozoologists or dismissed in some cases, which have added up over time and never been explained properly. The second is lack of new evidence in the field of cryptozoology concerning some species, some of these species identified uh, with, within paracryptozoology, especially considered the advances in technology. Third is the awakening, uh, which is an undisputed fact according to our own personal uh, research. More and more people are waking up to the possibilities which may lie outside the box of conventional knowledge and thinking. And finally, the fourth is a need for a field where these ideas can be shared without constant ridicule from those in cryptozoology who don't even acknowledge that the paranormal even exists. There may be other factors as well, but these are the most prominent we have noticed. Uh, now with that, now that we've defined uh, what paracryptozoology is and why it has earned its place at the table of the unexplained, let's look at some of the more prominent theories which are found in paracryptozoology. As these theories attempt to suggest or explain the reasons for the unusual activity or happening, uh, people report their encrypted encounters. Uh, you know what? Why don't we take a commercial break here? Okay. And then I'll just start with uh, these when we return. Okay, we'll do that. So you are listening to Paraversal Universe. This is the Paralogia Report. We will be right back with our panel for the final segment. You are listening to WBHM, digital broadcasting, the best in paranormal talk only on Paranormal Experience Radio. Broadcasting live, live, live out of Birmingham, Alabama.
Thank you for listening to WBHM Digital Broadcasting out of Birmingham, Alabama. The time is 45 minutes after the hour. Alrighty, we're back, everyone. This is Paraversal Universe, produced by WBHM Digital Broadcasting, also heard on WCETFM, High Point Radio, and the Rift Radio Network. We're your hosts, Kevin and Jennifer Malik. We're glad, we are glad you are with us, as always. Uh, we now have uh, the T-shirt for the logo for Lake Monstrosities for purchase. Half the proceeds will go to charity and the specific cause to help eight-year-old Daniel DeMiza, uh, who suffers from DeVette syndrome and seizures on a regular basis. The Lake Monstrosities is the largest social media group outlet for dedicated to aquatic mysteries and wonders of all kinds. Uh, so look for those shirts there. Uh, it's a great group, great artwork, a great shirt, and for a great cause. This segment is brought to you by the Five Star Reader's Choice Award winning epic fantasy trilogy Helm by Robert L. Malik. Alrighty, back to the show. This is Paraversal Universe and the Paralogian Report. And I'm picking up where I left off. I was reading an article about paracryptozoology and cryptozoology. And we were talking about uh, some theories uh, which attempt to suggest or explain the reasons uh, for the unusual activity or happenings people report during crypt encounters. First one is uh, cloaking and invisibility. Reports of Bigfoot disappearing without a trace isn't anything new. There is no doubt that Bigfoot is a creature of the woods and would be good at hiding or blending in. However, there are some reports where Bigfoot has disappeared when the locale doesn't allow an easy out, where the creature is there one minute and simply gone the next. Uh, I also find intriguing is that some trap cameras in the woods placed by investigators and hunters alike document bait uh, missing after a few anomalies, anomalous photographs or light anomalies or strange orb activity. It's not the norm, but it's not unheard of either. Portals. A portal is a gateway into another dimension. This may also explain why or how Bigfoot is able to hide so easily and well. If cryptids are using portals to go somewhere else, then this may explain why no one has ever come upon a sleeping cryptid like Bigfoot or Dogman before. This would also make these creatures interdimensional beings, as many people believe. And there have been reports of people claiming to see them entering or exiting portals, although these reports have been traditionally scoffed at by many cryptozoologists. And uh, I will also note that there uh, people have been following Bigfoot tracks uh, in the snow, um, in the mud, and uh, what they'll find is that they'll be following the tracks sometimes for miles, and the tracks will abruptly stop, uh, sometimes even in a field or whatnot, or a wide open area, totally unexplainable, uh, just like it walked in the thin air. So... Very interesting. Ghosts of cryptids. Some believe that uh, when we see cryptids, like Loch Ness Monster, for example, that we're really seeing a a residual or intelligent apparition of a long-dead plesiosaur. The same would apply to Sasquatch and Gigantopithecus as well. Demonic cryptids. When we look at cryptids like Mothman and variations thereof, uh, or cryptids like the Jersey Devil, One cannot rule out the possibility that these cryptids may be supernatural in nature, interdimensional, or even possibly demonic manifestation of some type. Things like glowing red eyes, manifesting before disasters, flying without effort, and occasionally vanishing, disappearing, can make it suspect. They're also most exclusively and always seen alone and or without a family breeding unit. When one adds up or adds metaphysics or demonology to cryptozoology, it falls within the realm of paracryptozoology. Holes in the veil. Basically put, the hole in the veil theory suggests that there is a veil between this dimension and one where ghosts, angels, demons, and spirits, and other various creatures may reside. And that this veil between our world and the spirit world is nothing or is always moving as the earth does. Sometimes there are holes in the veil. When a hole passes in front of and or between us and whatever entity it is we're noticing, we can actually see them during those few moments. When the hole passes, the image we've seen vanishes as well. 
It's an interesting theory, which is usually geared towards the spirit realm, but may actually apply to some of these cryptids people are seeing. Shapeshifting. A couple of cryptids are reportedly able to change their shape. Werewolves are a good example of this, certainly the best known. This is reportedly due to occult activities. Anytime we talk about people changing into monsters, we're again within that realm. Mindspeak. Some cryptid researchers, as well as others, have reported what they describe as hearing speech inside their head, as if someone or something is communicating with them. ESP is basic premise for parapsychological theories as well, and is continuously studied to date. Lights. Lights in the sky or forest have also been reported during cryptid sightings. This suggests uh, to many that there may be an extraterrestrial connection. Cryptids are also associated with ancient alien theories regarding genetic engineering, whereas slaves were created by a different alien race. Anytime one finds ufology mixing with cryptozoology, again, it falls within that realm of paracryptozoology. So in closing, uh, these are all theories which may uh, play roles at times. Not all Nessie settings are ghosts, please, source. Not all dogmen are shape-shifting into humans. And Bigfoot reports don't always have a magical element to them. But until we can get a solid and undisputed evidence for these mysteries, we should at least explore all the possibilities. This is all research into the unexplained after all. And yes, there are things we certainly yet don't know. So we have uh, five minutes to discuss this. I don't, we're not going to have time for the last article, unfortunately. I can bring that up next time. Uh, but... You know, I, uh, I, I personally am a believer that there are elements to some of the cryptid reports that are, uh, too mysterious and, and, and whatnot. I do think that there's a possibility that's, that there's something supernatural going on with some of this. Not all of it. You know, um, I, I do believe there are cryptids uh, that are just regular cryptids. Uh, the an example would be like the chupacabra, the the Tex-Mex version of the or the blue dog version, um, or the rain pendix, perhaps uh, would be an example of a cryptid that is not does not have supernatural abilities. But when you look at Mothman and the Jersey Devil and and these kind of things, uh you know, and and even, you know, some people believe that even the Loch Ness Monster, for example, uh, you know, Alex Crowley doing all that, you know, he had a, a place on the lake and he was doing all kind of occult stuff and who knows, you know, um but until we have solid proof I don't think we should be ruling anything out. Well, I'll just say from my end really quickly, because I know we're like running really short on time here, is, you know, remember that it was said in the Bible, if we could see a lot of what we don't see, we would go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. If we could see the spirit world, it would drive us mad because we're so busy and there's so much going on. Right. Probably a lot of hideous things, too. Um, Any final thoughts, Tom, regarding... This article? Well, the idea that when they find hairs from, um, that supposedly might have been from Bigfoot, uh, somebody just discussed that, uh, the DNA turns out to be somewhat like a human, but not completely. So, but then they, they just say that that's just human hair, but I heard, a different story about that, that it, maybe that's part of the DNA of the Bigfoot. What, did you ever hear about that? Yeah, the uh, the idea that, um, okay, if it were a, uh, a supernatural creature, when it manifests and is here, it's leaving tracks, uh, it's leaving hair. Uh, so we know for sure, at least part of the time, that it is flesh and blood, or at least, you know, physical. The question is, is it always like that? Because we can't find sleeping Bigfoots. We can't, I mean, we haven't, there's uh, the best footage we have 
is from the late 60s, the Gimlin Patterson footage. We, uh, with all this technology and the, and the trap cameras and satellites and you name it, we still don't have anything. So, I mean, it, it's, but yeah, I've heard about the DNA and, uh, you know, I, we would, I would like to have Melba, um, catch them on the show sometime. Uh, because we can discuss that. Um, she would be the one to talk to, I think. Kat, do you have any? I do. I have a question, actually, because this has been coming up quite often in my research lately. And I don't understand the terminology shift unless they're trying to differentiate between the, you know, research areas or whatever. But the mind speak... It's telepathy. I mean, that's what that is. And I know that when I've spoken with people relevant to the dog men that show up in Pennsylvania, the people, even those who are heavily armed and encounter them, are told, basically, you don't want to raise that weapon. We're coming through here. And they don't. Not one person has actually attacked a dog man that I have heard about, at least with the the groups that I know that do seek them out. But um, there's also a guy here in, in Alabama, and he is Alabama Paranormal and Bigfoot. His name is Jonathan Odom. And he has footage. And he has good footage. So, you know, he's not really well known. He's not really out there, you know, promoting himself very much. It's more of a group chat on his Facebook page. But it's really amazing. There is there is good work being done right now. And there is good footage available and um, I just think it's the coolest thing. I have my doubts that Bigfoot is actually here all the time. I think he's interdimensional. Um, that's just my opinion. But I just find that whole study interesting. I love yeah, it. I, I, will, I will say, uh, I'm not saying the, Gen- the patterson Gimlin field footage is the only footage out there i just it seems to be the most def, def, you know but yeah there is some there are other uh there is other footage out there which is very compelling some of which comes from people that that seem very credible and uh yeah you know um the reason i started the nwps uh mm-hmm. the catalyst for that was a bigfoot sighting i had um uh, Don Young, who is uh, part of the Paralogian Report, uh, sometimes is also documented Bigfoot, and he's got actual evidence. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's out there. We're going to be going. In fact, in a couple months, we're having an expedition. We're going uh, northern Wisconsin. It's a private expedition. Uh, with some prominent researchers in the field, we're going to go out and spend a weekend and and, and it, not just apply cryptid techniques, but paracrypto, uh, the paranormal stuff too, and apply, uh, you know, um, a, a, a paranormal equipment and and psychics and um, different angles and whatnot. We got two minutes left. I better wrap this up. Uh, so, I just want to say I hope that you have a wonderful time and I can't wait to hear what evidence you bring back because I think using psychics for that, for the communication, is brilliant. Yeah, we're going to be trying a lot of different things that uh, are tried within, you know, uh, parapsychology and metaphysics and whatnot. Um, but you won't see it on Finding Bigfoot or anything like that. But yeah. uh, tried because why not? So it's my take on it. I think y'all will have a great time and I think you'll bring stuff back. I'm interested to see it. Oh yeah. We're really excited about it. So, and we'll be filming it and whatnot. 
We'd like to thank <laughs> our well, yeah. for their wisdom. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Kat. Uh, and thank you, Howie. And thank you, Jean. Uh, feel free to support any of these networks mentioned here tonight, as well as another Wisconsin Paranormal Society LTD 501c3 nonprofit organization by donating. It's folks like you who ensure these excellent organizations will be here tomorrow. Next Friday, we have paranormal investigator Ted Van Son, so don't miss that. To the believer, the evidence is overwhelming. And to the skeptic, there will never be enough. Thank you. Good night. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you here next time. Good night, everyone. You are listening to WPHM Digital Broadcasting. The best in paranormal talk radio.